Now, I, I, this, is a, this is a full participation song. This is one of the songs, it's okay. You can sing it off key, all right? You can sing this song off key, it doesn't matter because we're not really listening to the tune, it's the words. And everybody in here ought to be able to testify that there's nobody like him. You can even just start out saying, it. yeah, 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 nobody like him. Yeah, yeah, just say it. Nobody like you, Lord. Just say it. Nobody like you, Lord. Nobody like you. Come on now, say it again. Say it again. Nobody like you, Lord. Come on now. Come on, no. No, 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 that's too hard right there. Come on, no. There's nobody like you. Come on now. You know he's unique. Nobody like him. Nobody like him. Yeah, I challenge you to find somebody. Come on now. There's nobody like you. Come on, one more time. Say it. Come on, come on. We want to say that. Oh, yeah. No one above you, Lord. There's no one above you, Lord. Come on now. Come on now. This is everybody's song. Everybody, everybody. If you love it, nobody like you, Lord. Just keep saying that. Keep saying that. Nobody like you, Lord. That's it. Y'all come up with one that stay in my head all week long. This is, I know this is going to be the one. Oh, nobody like him. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you. Nobody like you, Lord. Bless you. Yeah. Can I, can I, this, I'm not trying to prolong this at all. I just want to say this. They only lead us in worship. They don't worship for us. They just lead us. They set a tone, too. Yeah, but there are no, you know, worship graders in here. <laughs> you got to do what feels appropriate to you under the circumstances. And if that's doing nothing, then that's okay. That's okay. Nobody's grading that, but I, I got to tell you, nobody like him. Nobody like him. And every day as I keep living, as my granddaddy used to say, just keep living. That takes on more, more meaning as life unfolds for me. Simple words, just keep living. Feels out more, more and more every time. Yeah. Nobody like it. Ooh. All right. Thank y'all. We've been we've been in a sermon series for a few weeks now that we've called Lessons from Classic Rivalries. Lessons from Classic Rivalries. And <laughs> I think today will be the concluding sermon in, in it as we move into a period of stewardship concentration next month. In November, we always 
turn toward some definition or form of stewardship awareness. Um, and next month will be no different. I'm excited about how the Lord is going to lead us into those messages uh, next month. Uh, and we've been trying to elevate our thinking beyond the traditional stewardship messages of time, talent, and treasure. We've been trying to go much deeper than that because we have a responsibility to be good stewards of everything, the totality of what God has given to us, um, starting with us. So wellness, wholeness, all those things are important. And I, can, I don't think we can talk about those issues enough in our community because we have uh, too many people who are silently suffering. And I want to change that situation so that it's okay not to be okay at church. All right, that's important. It's okay to have issues going on at church and that this is a place that you can come for fellowship and consensus, and brotherhood. That's what this place is. No more suffering in silence. No more. It's time out for that. Time out for that. And so we'll see how the Lord leads us into those messages. That, you know, the caveat for me is it's got to be scripturally based in what we talk about, what we talk about. And I believe there are enough examples in scripture of how God has used people in certain situations who can be an example for us. Today, there is an example of a classic rivalry with a twist with a twist that I believe, and you might not consider it a classic rivalry, but I can tell you it's going to be familiar to you. The story, perhaps, will be, and the, certainly the players are familiar. The situation may have had developed in your life. All right, today we're going to talk about friends who became enemies. All right, friends who have somehow become enemies. And we're going to use Psalm 35 as our foundational scripture. Psalm 35. And the friends who became enemies in this instance are Saul and David. Saul and David. Let me see if I can read a little bit about you, because my Bible says uh, your Bible is one that's a study Bible. It's probably going to give you some helps in it. The caption in this is a prayer for help of David, a prayer for help. David is saying, starting at verse one, Lord, battle with those who battle with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Pick up the shield and armor. Rise up and help me. I'm reading the New Century Version, if I'm not mistaken. Lift up your spears, both large and small, against those who chase me. Tell me, I will save you. Make those who want to kill me be ashamed and disgraced. Make those who plan to harm me turn back and run away. Make them like chaff blown by the wind. As the angel of the Lord forces them away, let their road be dark and slippery as the angel of the Lord chases them. For no reason, they spread out their net to trap me. For no reason, they dug a pit for me. So let ruin strike them suddenly. And let them be caught in their own nets. Let them fall into the pit and die. Then he writes, then I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be happy when he saves me. Even my bones will say, Lord, who is like you? What a prayer. Well, a song from David now. It's interesting, and I love when you play behind like that. But you got to remember that the Psalms are a song book. These are lyrics to a hymn that David is writing. And I don't know what kind of music would be laid on this. All right. I don't. Um, I don't know. In a modern day context, you know, it might be what they do. They smile in your face. 
all the time and try to take your place. They're the backstabbers. Yeah, these are folk you let into your circle who turn around and stab you in the back. Y'all know the relationship. If you if you know anything about David in scripture, the shepherd boy, the overlooked son of Jesse. When they came in to anoint the one who would be king, y'all know that David wasn't even invited to the party. That's how forgotten and overlooked he was. And yet it was the Lord's plan that David would be the one to succeed the man on the throne, Saul, whose only qualifying factor for him becoming the king, in my opinion, is sarcastic, but it's what the word says, is that he looked good on a horse. All right? And, and, and the Israelites wanted somebody who looked good on a horse to lead them into battle. And so Saul was tall and he was handsome, but he had a character flaw. Yeah. God loved Saul, but Saul loved Saul too. Yeah. And Saul loved Saul more than God did, it seemed. And that's the problem. When Saul wasn't getting the shine, he wasn't happy. And that was a pivotal point in his relationship when he met the young shepherd boy who would replace him. He didn't know he was coming to replace him. All he knew, and I preached about it a few weeks ago, was that this young boy came apparently from somewhere to the battlefield when all the Israelites were cowering from the, from the Philistine named Goliath. And of all the warriors who were on the field that day, the ones who had fought the battles and been slaying all the folks, in all the previous battles, none had courage enough to step onto the field of battle to battle the Philistine named Goliath. But there was a shepherd boy who was just foolish enough to believe that God was true to his word. There was a shepherd boy who was just courageous enough to believe that if God could rescue him in the sheepfold from the bear and from the lion, that that same God could rescue him on the battlefield from this Philistine who was not just being ugly, he was downright disrespectful, not just to the Israelites, the author, he was disrespecting our God and talking about who is this God that's going to come rescue you. He was calling the challenge of challenges and nobody would answer it except for a shepherd boy named David. And David stepped onto the battlefield only with the instruments that he was used to using, not the chain armor, not the mail, not the helmet, not the heavy sword. He picked up a sling and two or three rocks and went on the battlefield. And God gave him the victory over the meanest, bad dude in town that day. He killed him. Then it happened. Then it happened, David. Then it happened because everybody's celebrating David. David, the shepherd boy becomes the toast of the town. Everybody knows his name. He's coming in from the sheepfold to the battlefield to the town where they are calling his name and celebrating him. And Saul is sitting back with his arms crossed and he hears them saying, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands and green-eyed envy jumped up all over him. He's saying, what? Here I am, the king of the land, and they are cheering for this shepherd boy? And from that point forward, Saul could not see straight. All he could see was that David was in his way. He didn't even know at the time that David had been anointed as his replacement. But watch this, because this is important. This is very important in the narrative. David was famous and didn't know it. David was famous and didn't show it. David went about being David. He wasn't trying to pull on any airs. In fact, Saul, in his disguised hate man, he was a frenemy at that time, invited David into the palace to start working for him. And David, as you can imagine, thought it was a thrill to be invited to the palace 
to work for the king. And so he came as anyone would to work for the king with all the energy he offered and gusto. It was almost as if he became a White House intern. You know how, how, how nervous you're going to be? Whatever they ask you to do in the White House, you're just glad to be in the White House. And if the president by chance sees you in the elevator one day, you thrill. You call him. I saw the president in the elevator today. This is David's mentality. He doesn't know that the president was looking at him side-eyed because he had already taken some of his glory by killing him, And he couldn't get that out of his mind. You know what? It didn't matter how many battles Saul won after that. All he knew was that day he didn't get the glory on the battlefield. David did. I came to tell you that's how it is in life. When you decide you're jealous of somebody, it doesn't matter how much good happens to you. You still can't see the good that's going on in your life because you're still jealous of that other person. Yeah, it's called, that's why they call it green eyed. All right, you can't see clearly. All you can do is see through the veil of jealousy and it shades everything in your life. Everything in your life. David works in the palace. They find out. He's a writer. He's not only a writer, he's a musician. He has the ability to play the harp. And the Lord has blessed him with the ability to make fine melody. And when Saul would get in his ways, he would call for David to come to his chambers. And David, the one he hates, the Bible says this now, would come and play the harp. And the scripture says, that it would soothe the evil spirits that were in Saul. So here he is now. The one Saul hates is in there playing the music that soothes him. It's amazing to me that even in that space, God still had favor on Saul at this point. He never prayed for David. He never tried to help David become better than he would naturally be. He didn't take him under his tutelage. He didn't do any of that. But there was one who was peeking on the side. There was one who had a right to be jealous, and he wasn't. See, because Saul had a son named Jonathan. And Saul ended up spending as much or more time with David, who he was jealous of, than he did his son, Jonathan. But Jonathan became friends. With David, you know why? Because David was a good dude. <laughs> he was good enough to know that Saul was trying to kill him, harm him, and he never, you're going to write something in your note, you can write, David never tried to harm Saul. Even when given the opportunity to kill him, he never tried to harm him. The Bible says that there was one instance when David was hiding from Saul because he found out that Saul was trying to harm him. And so he went on the run. And that's where we come to this psalm right here. He's on the run. He's hiding because David is a wanted man, all because Saul is jealous of him. And David is hiding in some caves. And it's, it's interesting. I tell you, you can find everything in the Bible. David is hiding in some caves, and Saul has to relieve himself. And so he goes into the cave to use the bathroom. And David is close enough to him to cut a piece of the cloth off of his clothing. And Saul does not even know it. He could have killed him. In a very conspicuous case, uh, a very conspicuous circumstance. If anybody in here ever saw the, the, the show Game of Thrones, yeah, there's a famous scene in Game of Thrones where the most hated son kills his father under similar situations, sitting on the on the throne, kills him. David could have done that under these situations. He wasn't actually on the throne; he was on the porcelain throne when he killed him. But yeah. David could have done that, but he didn't. And to show that he was no threat to him, Linda John, he sent the piece of cloth by someone and said, this is how close I was to the king. 
and I did not bring him any harm. Still wasn't good enough for him. Oh, it's a game of intrigue. And so here is David. David said, this man whom I love, this man whom I serve, this man who I am devoted to, who I went to battle for, who I have fought and won, this man is trying to do me harm. And now put that into the context of Psalm 35. He is in distress because somebody who was my friend is now my enemy and is trying to hurt me. So let's look at this and see what few lessons we can pull out of David in this time of distress. Now, Psalm 35 is 28 verses long. I commend it to you to read the whole thing so you can get the entire context of it. I only read the first 10 verses to you, but I, I commend the other 18 verses to you because it gives you a total picture of where, tall, uh, where uh, David was in this distress. But one thing you should know is that for some reason in life, and you know and I know, that the betrayal of a friend seems much more difficult than when your enemy harms you because you are emotionally attached to that person. You don't see it coming. You don't see it coming. You've got all your guard. You know, all your guard is down because they're your friend. You know when you go around someone who doesn't care for you, you already have your emotional walls up. You're already paying close attention. But when you're around somebody who means something to you, it puts you in such a, an unguarded position that it shocks you. Anybody who's ever studied literature knows the famous line, et tu, Brute, when Caesar turns to Brutus and says, you're going to stab me too? I got you walking right here with me, and you're the one who's killing me right now. And that's how it feels. That's how it feels when your friend stabs you in the back because you let them get that close to you. Jesus told Judas, what you're about to do, go ahead and do it. You're sitting right here eating. I'm feeding you right now. And I feel the evil in your heart. Go do it. And the betrayal of friends strikes us that way. And it'll shake you not just physically, but emotionally. It'll drain you. Because you start trying to calculate where you went wrong. Can I let you off some? You didn't go wrong anywhere. The problem is not with you. The problem is with the friend who is now your enemy. They have the issue, not you. So don't make their issue your issue. You can't make them not be jealous of you. Because they're jealous of who you are. How you do things. And you can't fundamentally change how you are, nor should you start trying to do so to appease them. That's what happens these days. Yeah, people start trying to change so folk can be their friend. This is a problem. Because the question becomes, how far are you going to change? When do you stop being you? So you can satisfy them. And watch this now. While you are changing to be their friend, they're not changing. They're still being who they are. And you're the only one who's changing. But David said this in his prayer in Psalm 35, as he's asking the Lord um, to bless him and protect him. He's, it's, it's a low time. He is clinically, I guarantee you, depressed. All right? He's hiding in caves. Case. He's wounded emotionally from the betrayal from the king of Israel. Who do you turn to? Who do you go tell that the king of Israel is the one who's trying to kill you? There's literally no one in the kingdom that he can turn to and hide I mean, and, and, and confide in. He is fortunate enough to be a valiant warrior. So he has men around him who will help him and protect him because they know that about him. But they can't help him with the king. They're not going to kill the king for David. And so he's in a very vulnerable spot. Popular, but pursued by the king. And so he says to him, he says to him, Lord, I want you to do a couple of things for you. I want you to battle with those, you, Lord, battle with those who battle with me and fight against those who would fight against me. Now, in the King James Version, the terminology that's used says that David wants the Lord 
to do two things for him. He wants him to be his counsel. All right? The lawyers, he wants the Lord to be his advocate. That's the word he used. I want you to be my advocate. All right? Interestingly enough, when he says this, the terminology that's used, David is saying, I want you to be my advocate, but I want you to do two jobs in one lawyer. He says, I want you to be my prosecutor and my defense counsel. And you say, how can you do that? How in the world can one lawyer serve two functions at the same time? See, because he's betrayed by the king. And he says, be my advocate. That's in verses one through three. And he says, he says, be my defense counsel. In other words, plead for me. I want you to plead for me. I want you, Lord, to let them know that I'm innocent of these charges. Put it on their heart. Let them know that I am not guilty of betraying the king and you are the one who can stand up and tell my story for me. Can I tell you something? You can't be your own public relations person. All right? You won't tell your story the way it needs to be told for them to hear you. You need somebody else to tell the story. Ask Kyrie Irving right now if he knows that he's flunking that in public opinion right now. He's flunking that. He should shut up. All right? He's going to ruin his career behind it. Ask ye about it right now. Was a billionaire last week. Now he a penny ass because he won't shut up. All right? They forget that money be on paper. <laughs> and when they start taking the paper from you, then you just, hey, ye. <laughs> that's all. Struggling, I'm telling you, learn that you need somebody to tell the story for you. And he's asking the Lord to plead my case. Not only is he asking him to plead my case, he's saying, I also want you to prosecute them. All right? Plead for me, but prosecute them at the same time. All right? Let them know that you are able to convict them of the wrong that they are doing for me, um, to me. So he's saying, be my advocate. And then he turns to another analogy, and I love this. He's saying, he's saying, because I want you to know the Lord can be your counsel if you let him, but he can also be your army of one. The Lord can be your army of one. You don't need the whole team. You just need him. To be your army. Okay? David prayed to the Lord to be his. I love this terminology. He said, be my warrior. Everybody know what a warrior is. You envision somebody who's coming to your defense as a warrior. And he called on him to be his defense. Be my shield. Be my buckler. Not only that, warrior, come on with your sword too. Whatever it is you need to defend me, Lord, be that for me. Be that for me. And then he does something, and we're going to learn a little bit on this. He prays something that's unusual in Scripture. And this is, this is really a whole Bible study in one, if we were just to go to this place. He prays as part of Psalm 35, David, an imprecatory prayer. It's called an imprecatory prayer prayer, all right? And it's almost, let me give it to you this, it's almost as if he's praying for a curse to be put on them. And you say, is that right? Can we, can we do that? Is that what believers do? Do we pray for curses? Wait till I, you, you, now you do it all the time. You do it all the time. You just don't know you're doing it when you say, I'm going to put the Lord on you. Folks say that I'm going to pray for you, but you say it in such a way as don't let nothing, nothing can come of you until the Lord say so. You know, it's an imprecatory prayer. Now, what is an imprecatory prayer? It means to imprecate or invoke judgment on people. All right. Bring calamity upon them. That's what you're praying for. And the question is, is that what he meant or is this a philosophical statement? No, that's what he meant. That's what he meant. We are taught these psalms. We're given these psalms as an example, all right, and as a philosophy too, but as an example. David is serious. He's saying, raise them up off me, Lord. 
I need you. Nobody else in this whole kingdom can help me but you. Anybody but me ever felt like that? That there's nobody you can turn to who can get somebody off you. The people who you normally would turn to are indifferent or on the other side. You say, Lord, please help me. I can only turn to you. And so he says to him, verses 4 through 10, that imprecatory prayer, he says, make those who want to kill me be ashamed and disgraced. He says, make those who plan to harm me turn back and run away. Make them like chaff blown by the wind as the angel of the Lord forces them away. Let their robe be dark and slippery as the angel of the Lord chases them away. For no reason they spread out their net against me. In other words, David is saying, not only are they at me, I'm going to use a word that's hard, but it's the truth. He says they're malicious in what they do. They come up with stuff that's just evil to try to get me. I know David ain't the only one that feels like that. You felt like folk just made up lies on you. They know it ain't true. How do they know it ain't, it's not true? Because they're your friends. And they know the truth. And they turn the truth on its head just to benefit them. Oh, David's in a spot right now, y'all. He's in a spot right now. He says, he says they, 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 they're just lying on me. Why is it that a lie cuts so bad? Why? You know it's not true. And yet the notion that people believe it is something that will not go away quickly. He says so in verse 8, so let ruin strike them suddenly. Let them be caught in their own nets. That's not new or it's not even the only place in Bible that we see this happening. There's a famous case of an imprecatory prayer being answered. And that's in the book of Esther. When Haman sets out to kill all the Jews and Mordecai. And he ends up building gallows to hang all the Jews. But there is a queen named Esther. Yeah, Hadassah gets close to the king. And she lets the king know that there's one around you who means harm to my people. And she uses the queenly way to say, if I mean anything to you, Dear king, then make sure that anybody who would harm me and my people suffers the same fate that they were going to put on me. And he says, so be it unto you that anybody who was going to harm you got to go the same way they planned. And guess what? He's standing in the room out there right now, Haman. But to make matters worse, God got a sense of humor. Even when he's executing judgment, the king Call Haman into his chambers and said, go get Mordecai. And I want you to put on Mordecai all my fine robes. I want you to put him on a fine horse. And I want you to bring him to me so I can celebrate him. And so the man who aimed to kill him has to fetch him, has to fetch him and bring him to the king. And then he is discovered as wanting to harm the Jews. And he ends up hanging on the gallows, not just him, but his whole family was killed. That's that's an imprecatory action that happens in Scripture. Can I tell you, this has positive meaning for those who believe, and it came, brings me to my last point for you today, because David prayed for God's judgment to be executed on his enemies, and I came to tell you that it's okay for you to pray that way. All right? Deal with them, Lord. You deal with them, but this is my last point, and it's also important, all right? You can have retribution without retaliation. This is crucial. You can have retribution. You can get them back without you retaliating. And how do you do that? Put it in the Lord's hands. You have got to put it in the Lord's hands. When you put it in the Lord's hands, God is going to deal with them We mess up because we try to straighten it up. And when we try to straighten it up, we continue to mess it up. And that becomes the problem that everybody has. Put it in the
the Lord's hand. Ain't that a song he's saying? All in his hand. I put it all in his hand. Yeah, all of my burden problems, he can solve them. But we need to stop trying to fix every single thing ourselves. He's been maligned. He's been abused. He's been the attempted murder on him. And what he's saying is, this is really, really important, Pam. He says, I'm going to keep my conscience clear. I'm going to keep my hands without blood. I'm simply going to take the matter to the Lord and leave it there and sit back and watch him. And how do I know he can do it? Red, because he'll be my counselor. He'll be my warrior. He'll fight my battles. He'll plead my cases. He'll go to the judgment bar for me. How do I know he'll do it? Because the scripture tells me he's already done it. All right? Yeah. When before the judgment bar I stand, he cannot find a thing. Why? Because I settled that account a long time ago. I put it all in Jesus Christ's hand. And Jesus took all these things to the cross for me. I don't have to fight these battles. You don't have to fight these battles. They can be won and your hands can be clean because it's Jesus's, it's God's job to protect us. We're his children. Don't you protect your children? You look out for them. You give them what they need and you make sure even in every kingdom. I told you last week I watch all these animal shows. I see mother animals will fight to the death to protect their young. And they will do so against the baby's father. Oh, it's in, in the animal kingdom. A mother something, bath, will protect her cub to the death against the baby cub's daddy. Why? Because that's her cub. Now, Lord knows if he can give a bear enough sense to take care of his own, her own, then he can certainly give us what we need in any circumstance with us being all right. So I'm here to tell you, put it in his hand. Put it in his hand, whether it's your outright enemy or your friend who has turned into an enemy. This is something you don't have to dirty your hands with, and God will straighten it out. I love this, too. I love the fact that not only can he straighten out the relationship between you and your enemy, he's the only one who can rehabilitate it. He's the one who can turn he who was your enemy back into a friend because he's the only one who can heal hearts, change minds. Who wouldn't want to serve a God? like that. And so if you got a situation that seemed too difficult for you to manage, I'm asking you to trust Jesus. I'm asking you to turn it over to the Lord. Give it to him and he'll work it out. We had a problem where we too were friends with God. We walked with him every day in the garden. He talked to us. And then we decided we wanted to know more than he thought we should know. And we fractured that relationship, Rihanna, with the Lord. And the Lord said, you can't stay in this place. Having broken my rules and we've done everything we knew to do. Can I say everything humanly possible to get back into a right relationship with the Lord? And guess what? We couldn't do it. But the compassionate mercy of our God is such that he wouldn't see his creation floundering. And so we couldn't figure out a way to get back to him. So he gave us a way. And the way he gave us was by sending his only son, Jesus, to show us how to do it. Jesus, they can't figure it out. Go down there and show them how to get back into a relationship with me. And Jesus, who was already the son of God, didn't think it was robbery, didn't think it was bad to come to earth. There was no elevator that could bring him to earth to let him live here, contrary to what somebody might write. There was no stairway to heaven that reversed and came down this way. There was only one portal 
whereby it would be legitimate for him to come and show us how to do it. And that happened to be the portal through a uterus on a woman named Mary. I'm just being real with you. That was the stairway from heaven back to earth. He had to come here and be born just like you and I were born. He had to live just like you and I live. He had to suffer the indignities that you and I suffered. And yet he did it for 33 years and was without sin. And he showed us how we could come and satisfy his father and be back into a friendship with him. God can take somebody who was a friend, who became an enemy, and he can make them a friend again, but only through relationship with his son. Do you know him? Do you know him through his son? Have you accepted the gift that his son has given? If you've never done so, then I extend an invitation to you just today to accept the, uh, the gift of friendship, which comes with an extremely big bonus, Karen. It comes with the gift of eternal life. Come to him, to the relationship with Jesus Christ. He's waiting on you. The doors of our church are wide open. We're waiting on you. Waiting on you. Come right now. He'll make it all right. You won't be an enemy anymore. You'll be his friend. He will save you, y'all. Yeah.